Okay. I, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Welcome to today's Distinguished Speaker Series entitled Shaping the Frontier of Innovative Financing, Fireside Chat with Mr. Charles Lee and Professor Wei Shi, which is the last activity of HKUST Business School Alumni Week. Thank you for your support, alumni. My name is Helen Chan. I'm the head of external and alumni relations at HKUST Business School. I'm your MC for this event. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping items for online participants. Please mute your mic during the event, and please leave your questions in the chat room on Zoom anytime. We will answer in the Q&A session after the chat. As digital technology continues to develop and entwine in finance, we, the demand for innovative models that can finance the real economy has rapidly grown. It is definitely an important area for all of us to learn, to stay competitive and relevant in today's shifting business environment. It is our great honor today to have Mr. Charles Lee, founder and chairman of MicroConnect and former Chief Executive of Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing Limited, Hong Kong X, to share his views on this fascinating and ever-developing financial backdrop. A little bit of your very illustrious history. During his 10 years tenure at HKX, Charles orchestrated some of the most significant strategic initiatives in Hong Kong X's history, including acquisition of the London Metal Exchange in 2012, the launch of the Shanghai Hong Kong Stock Connect cross-border trading scheme in 2014, the Shenzhen Hong Kong Stock Connect in 2016, the Bond Connect in 2017, and the listing reforms in 2018. Without further ado, let me invite Professor Wei Xi, the president of HKUST, to give welcome remarks to start today's fireside chat. Thank you, Professor Wei Xi. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a very fitting occasion for us to have a, an opportunity to listen to Charles, not only because of his uh, illustrious <laughs> career and accomplishment, but also it is doubly, I'm doubly happy to see that we are finally gradually resuming our in-person interaction, okay? Just by seeing we have several dozen of uh, our friends, colleagues sitting here in this room with uh, many others attending by Zoom. I hope we will flip the ratio before long. Having already introduced Charles' uh, background briefly, and uh, we are going to give everybody a quiz after the, the talk, <laughs> so you will remember. But uh, I'm not going to repeat uh, what Helen already said. Charles basically has been working on MicroConnect since he stepped down from Hong Kong X. But uh, today, I think we have a little bit broader range of issues we would like to listen to Charles' perspective. So I'd just like to start by maybe in framing a, a few points so we can have some anchors for Charles to get started. I think basically, of course, we all know with science, data, technology moving forward so fast, fundamentally, our finance, investment, and many related activities have been turned upside down, literally. So many banks are now science and technology companies instead of finance companies now. So this is one of the points I certainly, I believe Charles has an uh, insider's seat and angle to offer his viewpoints. Secondly, sustainability and green is front and central many times. However, what it means, I think we don't really have a clear understanding or even consensus. So a lot of time, we call something green without regard to the total life cycle and many other aspects. And hence, there's a, I can see growing controversy in some way 
in the form of uh, so-called greenwash. So this is one thing I feel in Hong Kong's context also very important. I hope uh, Charles can address that a little bit also. The third point is, uh, of course, about us, Hong Kong, with a lot of uh, accomplishment already, some clearly being led by Charles himself. How do we go forward with uh, the last few years of background as uh, what we need to recover and go forward? So this is another point I feel we need to have a conversation. Finally, of course, the uh, geopolitics is front and central. No place virtually is uh, out of trouble. However, Hong Kong being sandwiched between multiple sovereign powers, we certainly have our own share of the issues. So this is one thing we especially charge uh, background, I think, would be very fantastic for us to listen to this. Charles, please. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, pr President Wei. First of all, I want to know, wearing this is the requirement of the government or <laughs> is the organizer? And if I remove it, it's my personal liability or your organizer's <laughs> liability? <laughs> Charles, you're a lawyer. We are not. So <laughs> you, you should okay. tell us. Okay. <laughs> I'm fine I, if you want to remove it. Okay. <laughs> don't, uh, don't since me. you're wearing it, I, I feel my mind is not working with this thing. This is like a, this is like a horse that put. Allow our speakers to remove. Is that okay? If you don't mind, sorry. Oh my God. Like kind of our freedom of expression. <laughs> it's like I put a. Um, uh, we can sit a little bit apart just in case, right? <laughs> 1.5 meters away from each other. Yes. <laughs> Um, Let me do this. Okay, yes. Um, I, in many ways, I like interactions rather than monologue because uh, there's just so much going on and there's so many things I want to talk about. I also am suffering a particular syndrome right now. I just started a company uh, about nine months ago. Um, officially a year ago, but really started about nine months ago. I'm like uh, a father of a newborn baby. <laughs> and uh, I just, I'm so proud and love it so much that I can't stop talking about it. <laughs> and uh, so I don't want it to monopolize a monologue because, you know, I can talk about MicroConnect forever. And uh, so I'm sure you're not coming here just to, to listen to me about MicroConnect. Um, but MicroConnect is something that I thought about it for a long time. And in many ways, I debated whether to stay at the exchange for another long contract. I almost flirt the idea with the board that I, I can be there for another five years without a pay, with a dollar, give me a million shares. If nothing happens, you can take the shares away. I just do five years of work. But if it works out, you know, give me that shares. And I wanted, but the only base for me to continue to do that is to say, start a new exchange. Um, you know, let the market operate the way it is, but there's so many new things that we are able to do that we should do it differently because the old way is just not going to work. Um, but I was having a tough time um, expressing myself and uh, people probably don't get a clear idea of what I was talking about. So I guess what I'm saying is, when we talk about FinTech, when we talk about technology, when we talk about every Wall Street firm believe their uh, IT you know, uh, outfit, um, but from somebody who has wrong central market from the right at the beginning and in the right middle of it, I see fundamental problems and issues, and I don't see them how to get out. You know, I, I used to describe the financial market as a pack of wolf traveling on the snow mountain. The Goldman Sachs, the Morgan Stanley are the strongest wolf on the front. They're pioneering, they're chasing down prey, and uh, you know, they're moving very fast. And the, the weak, the old, you know, uh, you know uh, the vulnerables are in the middle and uh, at the back. 
And the rear guard of that wolf pack is the exchange, is the strongest, because the rear guard is the one who protects uh, the pack. But unfortunately, the rear guard, the exchange, the central market operators, whether that's a clearinghouse or exchange, anywhere in the world, and you know, whether you're in New York or, 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 or China, you are actually have no ability to abandon the weak and old. And they say, oh, you guys are not moving fast enough. OK, bye-bye. We're moving on. No, you can't. The universal service obligation requires you to service anybody who op choose to operate in the market, which means that entire pack, and then Goldman and Morgan Stanley, unless they are able to trade among themselves, and then they, can, they all know that we are operating, the whole global Wall Street is operating on a very, very old, bad, inefficient system. But that system connected everybody. So unless Goldman and JP Morgan and Morgan Stanley, they are able to say, okay, forget about the rest of the guys. We set up a new way. I'm sure they will invest literally a fraction of their IT budget today and build a completely new efficient platform and the trading extraordinarily efficiently and making investors feel that uh, not so much cost is in there. They're not able to do that and they probably don't want to do it because they want the weak and, uh, and the old and, and uh, because that's where the money is made. So as a result, the whole pack is not moving. The whole pack is moving at the pace of the slowest member of the pack rather than the faster members of the pack. That's why when you have a change sponsoring a reform, it's extraordinarily hard because you want to make sure everybody can be connected. But every time you want to do something new, you want everybody else to have a new system. But unless you have a transformative opportunity to say everybody change overnight into something so simple, God is going to pay for it. Nobody, everybody's going to fight you tooth and nail on any real change that will make the market better, more efficient. And we all know billions of dollars are spent into IT. And people somehow think Wall Street has the best IT people. No. I was in, you know, I visited the States in June. Almost every big tycoon of any big firm's head is talking to me about one thing how to get our people back to work. Because most of their IT guys just don't want to come back to work anymore. They, the Wall Street IT guys actually have the lowest self-esteem because the cool guys in IT are working in Silicon Valley or in Miami. Anybody working Wall Street is paid better than those guys. But they know they're, they're servicing a car that is 30 years old and, uh, and they're just patching it up there's no way it's not going to be a Tesla, you know. So that's, uh, so that's the background where I uh, decided to leave because I think China has a huge opportunity to potentially transform Wall Street and financial services altogether because of the fact it's a cashless society. When you have cash, no more. Then, which means that the business, the economic activities in China, in the soil, in the veins, are becoming digitally so transparent that you shouldn't be doing all the old way, the way we have been used to for centuries. So that's really the reason I started. So why don't I give it back to you and then move to something else, and then otherwise I'm just going to keep going. So in that context, China the mainland China is uh, certainly a huge market in its own right. It's fast developing. How do we make sense between the domestic? <coughs> so we, unless we are talking about dual circulation, which eventually the two circulation need to be connected. So in your view, how do we see that becoming more and more meaningfully connected instead of becoming more and more competitive to each other? Yeah, I think. Uh the China economy is driven by two big cylinders. One is the, you call it external circulation, which is really being the manufacturing of the world and is being the supply chain of the world. And that got China going for so many years. 
And that's also got China into a lot of the challenges today. And the global, you know, the whole world is having to deal with it now. And um, part of it says we can't rely on China. It's just too crazy to rely on China on everything that matters in life. But I think many, many more are growingly realizing that the train already left station. You know, there's no way you can replicate another global you know, supply chain. Like it or not, they're going to be part of the supply chain. It's always going to be in China. And it's just not going to change. I think people are, more people are coming to that realization with a lot of frustration, obviously. But to the extent they are able to replicate and uh, find alternatives, I think they will continue. So China will be basically trying to see whether they are able to adapt to it. And uh, it's going to be a lot more challenging for China as well. But the internal circulation is becoming a lot easier now. Not because, um, it's just because it's become bigger. And just because I think the consumer side of it and uh, you know the property sector is being hit very, very hard. But at least for 20 years, the property sector has finally gave the Chinese a sense of wealth that they have never felt for centuries. And uh, that sense of wealth is going to be impacted by the latest uh, um, policies. But it's already in the blood. You know, for, for my parents' generation, going abroad and just to travel is just not something even in their vocabulary. But today, you know, being able to travel, being able to just to spend money, being able to be seen anywhere in Iceland is almost considered to be everybody's entitlement and right. So I think that is, uh, and then the Chinese consu consumption is also different. The way we eat, the way we sleep, the way we wandering around, the way we move, the way we sort of uh, reside, it's so different. You know, for example, apartments, you know, if you ask Wang Ke, the new generation apartments are systematically shrinking the size of the kitchen in favor of the living room, especially for smaller apartment. The kitchen is really an afterthought now because the younger generation just don't cook. So they eat out and they order. And the order can actually put shapu shapu in your house and then somebody else come back and pick up. So the Chinese are going to eat and sleep and live so differently, which means the consumer economy in China is going to be largely among the Chinese themselves. Very few people in America want to have a foot massage, probably doesn't even know foot massage. <laughs> you don't have to have a lot of money in China to want to have a foot massage. And uh, all you want to have a haircut, but you want to have a head massage. So there are a lot of services, there are a lot of ways that we live, and then we just provide services to each other. So that internal circulation is massive. And uh, the reason we are so single-mindedly obsessed with this Micro Connect is that because we see such a huge blue ocean of investment opportunities in there. So there is not only about do good and do well. Investors will make a lot more money in there. And also, we are able to make investment, do better things for society, and build better things for the little guys, and do better things for greater impact, but better things for green, for better things for sustainability. So I just think, uh, hopefully, we are launching. Uh, we'll, set, we'll have a big event tomorrow afternoon uh, at the Mar Maria essentially celebrating the first 1,000 investment we have made in the last eight months. And we, we, we thought we were going to hit 1,000 by year end, but we already hit 1,000 by end of August. And uh, we probably will be 2,000. So it is something that, you know, I can get into a little bit granular later on so that you know that the, the Chinese consumer economy, which is 55% of the GDP, is going to potentially become a foundation of a tremendously interesting and new financial market for us to invest in. Yes, Charles, uh, certainly the big picture in that regard um, continue to be at least fascinating, right? Now, if we look at this from our own 
angle, namely within Hong Kong. We are part of China, but it's a different system. We used to be quite distinct. Now there are many efforts made to try to make better sense in terms of how to be different while being connected. And uh, with certainly the COVID uh, impact, we also see Singapore, among others, are becoming different relative to, to Hong Kong. So what's your take in terms of Hong Kong's role and the way it go forward? Yeah, I think uh, that's, a, that's an issue that we obviously, everybody uh, feels so anxious on. Um, but I think we need to remove the elephant in the room because the elephant is not gonna be here forever. The elephant is the COVID restrictions. And uh, because that restriction, if your assumption is that this sort of restriction is gonna be part of the norm, then we're finished. Um, but fortunately, it's not. You know, clearly everybody know that this is just something that thank God is on the way out, probably rapidly uh, on the way out. So it, with that elephant out of the room, we're back to the, the oldest debate among all of us who care about Hong Kong is, are we better, are we worse, are we becoming irrelevant? We are, constantly have that anxiety. I think which is, I think is a good thing because people in Hong Kong are not complacent. We're constantly looking. You know, in many ways, we Hong Kong people are like Singaporeans, like a, the Israelis. We are very little place. And we're in the middle of big forces. And we're constantly asking ourselves, are we relevant? Are we being marginalized? Are we being squeezed? So I think that psyche is not an unhealthy thing. I think it's a good thing that we do. Um, but one thing I feel that Hong Kong people need to learn from Israelis and Singaporeans is to have a greater confidence in ourselves, a greater confidence in our system, greater confidence that our system as is, is important to China no matter what you're hearing. And, uh, and the people there are the smartest people in the world. They may not necessarily always say smart things. They may not always look very terribly smart, but you know behind the room they're smart because they, their decisions are deliberative. Maybe political, maybe a lot of things we don't like, not, not as transparent, but they're not dumb. And uh, so Hong Kong as is extraordinarily important to China. And um, I don't think there's any forces there that are deliberately set to change so many of the things that matters to all of us. Open society, free market, freedom of the press and expression, freedom move movement, and um, uh, absolute you know, judicial independence in the common law system. And um, you, know, you can list all of that, and I, I think uh, I, I, I continue to feel that it's going to be here because everybody wanted to be here. There are always going to be some noises, and unfortunately in China and sometimes in Hong Kong, it's the noise, noises made by the one or two percent usually you know, is so loud that it seems to kind of crowd out the voice of the 98%, because the 98% typically don't make screaming uh, noises. And I think we just need to be able to see through them and, um, and, uh, and break through them. Yes, uh, there is a long-standing term called uh, silent majority, right? But also, Hong Kong has many, many very smart, intelligent people for the very same reason as uh, you mentioned on the mainland front. So I think more technically, if we look at Hong Kong trying to find a way forward, there are many things which need to be done, especially considering Hong Kong has so many important financial service organizations, many of them you already mentioned in your introductory remarks. How does Hong Kong respond and address IT 
and the related uh, innovation need. So Hong Kong can continue not only to stay relevant, but also to lead. Because the characteristic of the organization, in my view, as an outsider, in Hong Kong is a little bit different because we don't necessarily, we used not to be the one to make all the central decisions globally for this organization. But now they are here. They need to be, in some way, a little bit more autonomous if they can make sense better for Hong Kong and this regional need. And the science and technology will obviously be part of the engine to drive this. And from whatever little I have heard, we seem to be not quite moving as promptly and confidently as we hope we would. So what's your advice and how do you think we should address this? Yeah, I think um, Hong Kong's strength lies in its, at least historically, lies in its lack of activism. Because we all come to Hong Kong not because Hong Kong government did something last month or did something last year or did something last, or special policies that came here. Most people come here because things here you can count on. They won't change lightly. And, you know, sometimes we may like them to change certain things more efficiently, more effectively. But in many, many ways, when we make decisions on your moving your family, moving your career, moving your capital, it is the places reluctance to be an activist sometimes is actually quite important. Because, you know, if a particular government can quickly do one thing in order to satisfy a particular needs at the time, implicitly in our mind is that he can also do other things you may not like next time. So I think um, I'm not necessarily always going to be on the camp to say, oh, no, no, the government should be doing this, look at the other guys are doing that. I think uh, we need to sometimes have a sense that uh, laws, policies, rules need to have a more sustainable stability. Sometimes that's very, very important. But there are historical moments that you could do a few or one or two big things that I th sometimes can actually change the trajectory of history. Talking about technology and science, I think we, at the end of the day, we're really talking about people. We're not gonna get a lot of German scientists and Russian scientists, American scientists come to Hong Kong, let's face it. The, the whole idea is whether Chinese scientists and technologists in China or already outside in the West can and want to make Hong Kong a home. I think that's really should be the goal. And I have great confidence that if we do a couple of things, we should absolutely be there. Because most of the Chinese, once you're successful, whether you're successful in financial resources and capital accumulation, or you're a scientist, or you're an artist, or whatever, and you're a businessman, as soon as you become more successful, there's always a desire to say, I want to be out of China a little bit. I want to visit more, I may, maybe I even want to live more, or maybe I want to move some of the money out. Not because they're not patriotic, but when you are more successful, you want to have greater options. And you want it to have a little bit more, less constraints. So Chinese people, generations of strong Chinese people will find ways, as soon as they become successful, they will find ways to come out. People say they're wrong, like a run, run, right? No, they're not gonna run away far. As soon as they get out, get out of China, the next question become, where do I go from here? They look around the world, unlike 30 years ago when, I, when you and I went to America, you know, we felt welcomed. We, we felt that was a land of free. Today, you know, the Chinese, Chinese people are not terribly welcomed in a lot of places. <laughs> so they know. So some will travel even further. Most were trying to find a place not too far away, and Hong Kong is the most natural place. And then for those who have gone, 
like you and I, we all went there 30 years ago, 20 years ago, we make America our home, we all came back. But when we came back, do we go back to China? No, we don't. We would like to be back to China, but not to China. <laughs> you know? That's in Hong Kong. Because we, because we all know we love that country, but we also want to have certain different choices of life here. But we wanted to make money there. That's the only place we really, really know how to make money. That's the only place we, can, we know really, really how to create a company, how to hire people, how to do all the people, because we know that market. So everything about China is in the hearts of the Chinese. But sometimes they want to come out, sometimes they want to go back, but not go back. But, so Hong Kong is always going to be here. So the key question is, going back a long-winded way of trying to answer your question, is, I think we are at a point where we could completely, our city, the way it is, is not going to be able to take in another two million people without creating massive social problems. But we could build a northern met metropolitan and public area. And we could make this into a 10 million people city. And we could make that 2.5 million people, are the, all the people in China, the scientists and the successful people who wanted to have a place outside, but still close enough at home. For anybody who already traveled far and spent their like kids are growing up, they want to, you know, all they want to come back for whatever reason, we have a good place there. And the risk of building that is so small because when you build Pudong, it's a rice pad. It could be just completely a ghost town. You built Futian 30 years ago, it's a fishing village. Today, if you build anything in northern Hong Kong, New Territory, it's gold because it's already diamond across the, you know, the river. So it's actually, it's just how to overcome some of our unhelpful bureaucracies and processes that have been in the way of not doing anything, and then really make sure the next five years we create a, you know, um, a safe harbor, a, high, a heaven for all the Chinese who need a home, who need to come home, but come home and live in Hong Kong, and I think is there. Um, I think we are going to open up for the Q&A pretty soon. I'd just like to add a, maybe a couple of points in kind of a, to complement what Charles just said. Hong Kong certainly by nature is very international, but also because of the many reasons we know very well, predominantly has Chinese population. Having said that, I do feel that we, it is very, very open, important for Hong Kong's sake and for people's sake that we uphold and maintain the diversity internationally. Even though there are many Chinese, ethnically <coughs> Chinese people who would move here, but uh, it is extremely important for us to continue to make sure Hong Kong is open and welcoming people of all background and color because I came here 12 years ago. One thing that always impressed me was that Hong Kong is naturally open and international. I hardly saw people certainly have very strong opinions, especially for those who do not speak very good Cantonese. <laughs> On the other hand, people don't raise any eyebrow when they see any foreigners. Okay, there's no need in that sense for things like a particular enforcement legally because it really, in a very important manner, Hong Kong has been able to accommodate and welcome people. The second point I'd like to make is uh, on the, maybe on, a little bit on the reverse side, the geopolitics and the many things around the world has been fast changing. But I would like to suggest that we certainly see certain flux in terms of movement of the people but it is very, very important for people to move because of their sense of opportunity and what they would like to do in the future instead of trying to leave place because they feel they are 
no longer as welcome. I think that's a very, very fundamental difference. And uh, Charles and I, we both spent many years in the States. Certainly, the situation between the US and China has been fast evolving. But I still feel that, especially under that situation, we should not shy away from looking at the way for people and society to continuously being connected and in fact to collaborate. That's so important, otherwise we are going to see just even far worse in the scenario which nobody wants to see because that also is fundamentally against the history. Okay, so these are the two points that I like to make to remind us that I don't think that's what Charles meant. I just want to make sure that we all are on the same page, that we are not going to be inward looking. We also want to be open and proactive to reach out. So there can be good continuing mutual support and understanding. Okay. If I can just quickly follow on that, when I suggest the Chinese coming here, 2.5 million, um, I think there is a risk which the president uh, clearly pointed out, that am I suggesting that this is a place for Chinese only, not for Westerner? No. The Western, but we need to realize the Westerners who come here and not come here just because they like Hong Kong. They come here either to do business or to, uh, you know, to work or to have, so essentially if the strong, the strongest, best Chinese are here, the best Westerners will be here. And uh, I just personally don't feel that uh, somebody in Kansas who has absolutely zero connectivity with anything in China is going to want to come and move to Hong Kong. No matter what we tell them, that will give you a free apartment. I don't think they're going to come. So it's really about your best people here, and then the best people of the world will come here because they want to interact and work and together and the benefit and, uh, and potentially uh, you know, um, do business you know, with you. Yes, I think we like to promote and encourage such a natural exchange and uh, free of choice. And uh, also to make sure the society, our city, will really support the resident and also to welcome the new comers. Okay. I think, Helen, you, you want to start now? I, I, I see from your body language. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I got a lot of questions online, but I think we give a little priority for our you know, friends here to ask questions to our you're very wonderful speakers. Okay, Michael. Oh, can somebody bring the, the mic over? Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Wei, for your insightful comments and remarks. Uh, uh, the takeaway for me, it's about connectivity and uh, the role that Hong Kong has to play. I think over the past couple of years, um, one of the trends that I'm, I'm hearing more and more, you know, from you know, clients and the business sector is that China is moving in a direction that is creating its own unique system, infrastructure, rules, um, so much so that uh, some businesses have to look at Asia x China. Just like, you know, many years ago, we looked at Asia x Japan because Japan was so unique um, in many ways, you know, culturally, systems, labor laws, etc. cetera. Um, so, this was, this was um, a bit, you know, kind of unsettling for me in that, you know, I've, I've, you know, kind of grown up, you know, thinking in terms of China being, you know, that connectivity for Asia. But I think over the past couple of years, we've seen a disconnect. I just wanted to hear whether you agreed with that statement, um, you know, how you see the, you know, trajectory and the role that Hong Kong, you know, can play um, too resolve you know, that connectivity question. Thank you. Um, I think uh, um, let's talk about uh, the Chinese financial system you know, first and see whether because you know, Japan has its own financial system. In many ways, the uh, Chinese have its own financial system not completely dissimilar to a, a Japanese. Um, there is this sense of public money that is the government is the custodian 
of people's wealth. So that mentality is very deep in the Japanese and Chinese psyche. That's why financial services where in the West is all investors be aware. And you know, between an investor and, uh, and, and, uh, and business, you are all adults. You're gonna deal with each other. We, we regulate your disclosure. Otherwise, we're not gonna protect one or the other. But when you have a financial system where the government strongly believes that it is a custodian of people's wealth, and that the money is not free, you can think of Chinese money as being pushed out to the Himalayas in a big dam, and um, the capital control system is such that money is not going to be flying, uh, flowing around like ocean. If that's the case, you think about you know, so whoever can get water at that altitude and be able to distribute the water at the lower altitude, imagine that interest spread. You know, imagine the water pressure. So that's why government is in China on the financial services is always going to watch out, very wary of anybody who are able to get money up there and, uh, and then you charge, because that interest spread essentially is the sovereign face and credit. That's why people just keep co trying to corrupt in bank officials and insurance officials so that they can get money there and then make that risk-free arbitrage. When you do small things, fine. Government sometimes you know, may not worry. But if you do something on a very massive structured way like what we have seen the last couple of years, <laughs> you know it's just never going to work. So from that perspective, yes, that system is, is different. And it's always going to be different. So, but MicroConnect, we are fundamentally believing that if you try, the reason small business, everybody wants to help small businesses. But why we have all failed, we all failed almost without exception, is that we're using fixed income. We're taking fixed income kind of money. We're providing fixed income kind of uh, investment. When you are charging interest spread, that's really never going to be successful. And um, because you're not participating in the risk, which means that you are not able to charge a reasonable return, your return is capped by interest, and you're taking public money with the interest spread, then the, whatever risk you're creating, it, it's all accumulated onto the sovereign. So you know the sovereign one day is gonna come back to you. So our business, fundamentally at the macro level is to actually say, we're investing in stores. Instead of Wall Street picking a stock, we're picking a store, number one. Number two, we're giving them money almost like equity, meaning if the small little shop didn't work out, it doesn't have to pay us back. And we're not giving them as equity in the sense that who wants to have an equity of a little guy who will never do an IPO? Then you're going to say, who, which investor is crazy enough to be in that sort of a junior position? Well, that junior position is massively overcome by our ability to collect the money every day. So being able to collect the money. So we are launching a new asset class, not equity, not debt. It's going to be a completely new thing that is, I'm convinced, is going to become the next big thing in financial services, what we call DRC daily revenue contracts. So we are able to collect money every day on that return. So every day there's an exit, and then you can reinvestment. So therefore, the cash return from that seemingly junior position, which we are getting about 12% return annualized, but coupling that compounded impact of being able to reinvest because you're collecting money incrementally every day, it's tremendously quality return for investors with tremendously helpful sharp ratios. But meanwhile, you're helping the little guy, you're supporting common prosperity. Great. Uh, any more questions from the floor here? Yes. Can you announce your name and also? Yeah. Um, that's really interesting. Can you discuss a bit more how that actually works on a practical basis? Absolutely. Um, we're going to publish a white paper tomorrow. 
read it if you're interested. They will tell you everything. Everybody say, Charles, how can you do this? Everybody know what you're doing. Well, if people want to copy and do it faster and make it easier, uh, you know, go for it. So essentially, it's a contract with the little guy um, that operate uh, like a, a revenue sharing um, a contract that stipulate how much we're getting every day from that revenue. And that, because of China's uh, you know, uh, uh, payment system is completely without ca cash anymore. So all the little shops revenue are not only transparent, that they are interceptable. That we put a digital device before the money hit the, their bank account, we will actually split automatically every day. So that's how it is done. But obviously, every investment is very small. It's only a few hundred thousand yuan. In order for this to be a massive business, you need to be able to invest in hundreds of thousands and over time millions of investors. How can you possibly do that? There's so many ways of doing to do it. It's actually not terribly difficult. You obviously modulize everything, you know, make sure your computer, everything is online. But in terms of actually roll out, we go with the franchisors. Basically, like McDonald, right? But McDonald is not the best example. There's so many McDonald's, but smaller McDonald's and Kentucky Fried Chickens. America probably have 20 big brands, you know, and everybody just eat 80% of the time in Wendy's and Burger Kings and all of that. The Chinese eat at least 10 different kind of cuisine a week, you know, this little restaurant, that little restaurant, this. And that. There are so many franchisors. So what we do is to go with the winner. So you go with the franchisor, but we're not investing in the franchisor. We're not lending to the franchisor. It's the shops. We are essentially just saying, you have to have a business that your store on your franchise, you're already collecting money every day. Your business model is a percentage of the revenue of the store. You have to have that business already. And then we basically just buy a portion of the cash flow for all the stores you have, put our little device, digital device, next to yours and be able to collect the money. Fascinating. OK. Uh, maybe we, we should go to uh, several questions that we have on the floor. I mean, I mean on, online. Then we can kind of see how it goes. Um, Charles, uh, the innovation circle in Hong Kong is hoping to make Hong Kong the innovative financial hub. In, <laughs> in your opinion, under what condition Hong Kong can really become that hub and what policymakers can do to make it happen? We always look at policymakers. <laughs> That's the last place you look. <laughs> do it yourself and find a way to do it so that the policymaker don't give you trouble. Wow, that's a, that's a very powerful answer. <laughs> okay, uh, there's another question, actually, uh, talk about uh, university role. You said China has platform and infrastructure to hugely you know, change the financial world. What would your, be your advice to universities in Hong Kong, particularly HKUST, to work with the industry to provide needed talent and research and to make it happen? That's not an area I have a lot of expertise, so maybe I shouldn't be uh, pretending that I know something I don't. The president is here. <laughs> president. Um, <clears throat> basically, I think it's a two-way street. It's not uh, just for universities to passively responding to the situation. And uh, there's a lot more need for university to predict, foresee, and provide, and uh, improvise, in fact. Mm -hmm. But the, I think the, one of the major need is to understand that university, even though now compared to 20, 30 years ago, university by nature has changed so much. But many outside people's uh, mindset and the perception about university remain unchanged. So a lot of uh, very well-informed citizens, not only in Hong Kong, elsewhere, I think colleagues, my colleagues, myself included, we just sit in office and uh, drink pina colada every day, <laughs> okay, and do our own one-page paper every so often. It's just, uh, I, th I think it's important for 
our friends and partners will come to university on some kind of periodic basis. Partnership needs to be forged by getting to know each other better and by meaningfully exchanging ideas. Mm -hmm. University, in fact, welcome to be challenged. And in the meantime, university should challenge the existing status quo. That's partly our job. We are not just training graduates. Our faculty and our students are supposed to come up with original independent ideas and thinking. So people like Charles can consider. And we also need to understand what he's up against so we can better support and collaborate. I think this really is a very, very essential. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yes, um, actually, a little bit about um, how Hong Kong can play a role to help SMEs in China. The Beijing Stock Exchange was established last year aiming to help to serve small and medium-sized enterprises in China. How could Hong Kong X or Hong Kong financial sector can play a role? Yeah, I think uh, um, as soon as you start to talk about exchange, even though it's exchange for SMEs or small enterprises, we are already moving into a universe of big companies. Um, you know, the biggest human innovation, in my view, other than the machines, you know, like, uh, um, you know, all the industrial uh, innovations, is really the, the creation of shareholder companies. Mm. Shareholder company is really the foundation of industrialization because you're able to pull everybody's money together and then form a company and then support that. So the entire financial services is pretty much built upon that system. So that system, because there is very little visibility and uh, you know, in, uh, ability to know what's really going on in the ground in the business. So what we do is to allow companies to organize their businesses and then create a set of rules and accounting and uh, many other information disclosures, procedures, and protocols for companies to be able to tell investors what they do because business, different businesses are different. So, <clears throat> which means that the entire Wall Street model, what I call a trinity of trust, have three big, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, 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 big anchors to it. One is you have to have a big product so it's equity or debt, which is all complicated, regulated, and a structured product as to what's the relationship between the investor and the company. And the second is the information discovery process because people need to know what they're really investing in. And then there's a price discovery um, functions. All of this is done by professionals, by big institutions, and, you know, broker dealers, banks, and, uh, and investment banks. And then lastly, once you know the information, once you know the price you want, to, who is going to guarantee the money is going to come back? Mm -hmm. That's the, the clearing houses, the exchanges, all the market operator. So this three, product, and, and information, price discovery, and delivery, is the big triangle, what I call trinity of trust of Wall Street. In order, to, just think about it. The product is complex, sophisticated, institutional, participation is extraordinarily expensive, and obviously all the professional intermediaries to do the work. So as a result, anybody, the traditional model, Wall Street model, requires companies to come to the market to prove you're good, and then disclose. So even small company exchanges like Beijing and others, globally there are only 15,000 listed companies. We have 3,000 here, the U.S. has 4,000, used to have 8,000, London have few, China have 3,000. So we are talking about 15, 20,000 at most globally companies that are, that are really investable underlines, meaning you can actually invest in them. Only 10,000, 15,000 of them, only 20% of them trades every day with some real meaningful volume. So we are really talking about potentially thousands of every investor, global money, it's just being oh, Apple, Google, this and this and this. Mm -hmm. All the money is there. It's all money game. Whether money goes up, whether price goes up, price goes down, 
Sometimes it's a function of what's going on with the company. Most of the time it's a function going on between the investors. We all like it, price goes up. We all hate it, price goes down. Even though the company didn't do anything that make any difference. So therefore answering, it's a long-winded way of answering that question. That traditional model of going to the exchange with that big triangle is never going to help little guys. The little guys just only raised a few thousand, a, a, a few hundred thousand yuan, maybe a few million yuan, will never be able to hire enough people to do all of that things. And nobody wants to see a company listed and, you know, raising a, a million Hong Kong dollars. Who cares? And, you know, disappear. So therefore, we need to find a completely different way of doing it. And MicroConnect, our target is in 10 years, we're going to hit 5% of China's small shops. And that will be in millions and millions of shops. So instead of investing in thousands of underlines, we want the market over time to invest in millions of underlines with individual transparency because we're collecting money every day. We're di disclosing every day how much money we're getting from that particular noodle shop. So investors know exactly what's going on everywhere. Transparency, granularity, and making regulators work like complete heaven because they don't need to work. They just look at everything. Everything is blockchain based. Everything is store based. Everything is daily based. And we just don't have to have all this accounting rules. Today, finance people, we, we, we have to have huge financial CFA test in order for us to understand companies' books. We have to wear big thick glasses to, work, to see them. <laughs> And that's why if, you know, that's okay. In the past, that's the only way to do it because there's nothing to see on the ground. Today, everything is on the ground is digital already. You need to remove the thick glasses in order to see them. That's why finance people, typically when I talk about microconnect, say, Charles, you're crazy, never gonna get done because uh, you don't do the books, you don't do due diligence. We already invested in stores in Tibet. I can guarantee you none of my guys ever visited it because you do it differently. Wow, sounded like we're gonna be facing some really major shakeups of what we know as given, and what is Charles seeing, you know, the future. So um, a bit about, you know, Greater Bay Area, uh, as you know, we have a new, a new campus across the border. And so any, any comments or, you know, views about the potential of Greater Bay Area and Hong Kong? He has a greater big camp. <laughs> Actually, before the session, Charles and I, we chatted a little bit about the uh, HKUC Guangzhou campus. Yeah. And uh, it was designed, conceived, and uh, now being implemented based on a very, I would say, quite um, unique vision compared to any other university which do the second campus. First of all, it's not designed to be a satellite campus. Namely, it's not supposed to be subsumed by the other campus. And we purposely want to do so because what we do in Guangzhou is to realize what we may want to do here in Hong Kong, but not because we're in Hong Kong, just for any university operating in a single campus, it is fundamentally challenging to do both disciplinary and cross disciplinary season wide, because the two need to support each other, but two unavoidably will run into competition. So our thinking from day one was to have a new campus funded by a separate entity. In this case, Guangzhou City has been funding our second campus totally. And then, most importantly, we have designed the new campus to have no overlap compared to what we have been doing here for years in Clearwater Bay. Whatever we do in Guangzhou is supposed to complement, not to overlap, not to mention compete with our new campus, with our own campus here. So this way, I think we will get students and faculty to work together, to collaborate, so to do things that either side cannot do completely. Mm. And now throwing the Greater Bay and uh, all these things that Charles and many friends here have just been exchanging, 
I think we really have a very unique opportunity. There are many challenges because of the system requirements and the like, but it's our challenge. It's up to us to address the issues, and uh, if we can make it work, we'll be unique in the world. Yes, we certainly hope both MicroConnect and HKUST will, in our journey of discovery of innovation, uh, will have great progress. So um, we are very sorry that we have to wrap up uh, this moment, and I really thank both Professor Wei Shi and also Charles for the wonderful sharing and insight. And I wanted to say thank you for all the audiences online or in person for the wonderful you know, attendance. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great thank day. You. Thank you.